both gathered here and uh, those who are joining us online, we welcome our visitors with us this morning as well. Uh, in the way of announcements, uh, we know we, we've got some out in Omaha and for a good reason, so uh, we uh, pray everything works out real well for them. Uh, also remember that after our worship service this morning, we have our uh, end of the month fellowship lunch. Everybody is invited to stay for that. There's lots of food. And so we hope you'll stay and enjoy that time of fellowship. At this time, we will begin with our opening hymn, 37, in our hymnals here. I sing the almighty power of God. Spirit poured out 
into our hearts and lives that bind us to you as your children, that bind us to one another and to all Christians everywhere, Lord, as your family. And we just pray for the church today, the church universal, that, Father, your people, wherever they gather, wherever they worship, that, Lord, you would encourage them, that your spirit would bring them strength and purpose. We lift up those who are struggling, Lord, to worship where it is forbidden. We lift up those who are struggling to minister to others who are in harm's way. We ask your strength, your guidance, and your protection to be upon them and on the pastors who lead them. We pray, Lord, for our congregation. We give you thanks and praise for all that this congregation has meant to your church in the past, for what we're doing now, and pray that you would continue Father, to give us a vision for the future, to seek out where we can serve you best by serving one another. Lord, we are thankful that we have this privilege to gather freely to worship and pray, Jesus, that as we turn our hearts and our minds toward you, that we would feel your presence with us in this place, that we would truly hear the word that you have to share with each one of us, it will give us direction, inspiration, and strength to go forth and serve you in this week. We lift up those who are sick, Father, and pray that you, the great physician, would heal their bodies. We pray for those who are struggling with grief, that through the power of your Holy Spirit enveloping them in your love and grace, they would find comfort. And pray that you would receive our praise and thanksgiving for all your blessings as we worship you in spirit and in truth this morning. As we lift our voices together in hymns of praise and as we lift them together now in the prayer that your son Jesus taught all his disciples to pray as we say. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our second hymn this morning is I Am Thine, O Lord, 159 in our hymnals here. If you're able, I invite you to stand as we sing. Precious. 
Heavenly Father, as we come now bringing our tithes and our gifts, we truly are thankful for the many, many ways in which you touch and bless us. And we're thankful, Lord, for this opportunity to give so that the work of building your kingdom may continue in this community and throughout the world. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
gospel lesson this morning is from the ninth chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through 62. Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to Jesus, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Then Jesus said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, No one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. Please be seated. Oxford College in England is 926 years old. Now, our nation is just barely 200 years old. This is just a college there, 926 years old. And within Oxford College is another college that they call New College, okay? And New College is 600 years old. They still call it New College. And in the new college, there is a building, a main hall that's 500 years old. And running down the center of this huge vaulted ceiling in this building is a main support beam, massive beam made of oak. One solid piece that's 100 feet long. And those of you that have seen uh, the Harry Potter movies, it, it's like the long great hall there, that massive thing, okay? And several years ago, they discovered that that huge main beam was beginning to rot. So the trustees contacted several contractors and told them that they had to replace it and they needed to replace it with another beam exactly like the one that was there so that they could remain faithful to the original architecture and so on and so forth. Well, the contractors then explained to the trustees that that was impossible since no oak trees existed old enough to create a single 100 foot long main beam that massive. So what they would have to do is to make the beam out of steel and concrete and then put oak paneling around it to make it look like it was a big oak beam. And the trustees did not like that, but they understood. And so they contracted uh, with some people to do this, and the contractors began to uh, put everything together to make their bids for the jobs and so on and so forth. And in the meantime, maintenance began clearing out all of these old rooms up there. A room, some of them hadn't been used in a very long time. Some of them had just been stored since when the building had been constructed. And in doing that, they, they came upon a, a, a cache of old documents up there. And the trustees went pouring through these old documents, hoping uh, that they could maybe find uh, some building plans, if any still existed, to show uh, how the building had originally been done and constructed to try to help the contractors with their job of reconstructing it. And while they were going through this, they came across a deed, a 500 year old deed that had been made at the time the construction was going on for that big building. Uh, an English nobleman had donated all the wood for building this new college and had deeded a piece of property to the college, quote, for the purpose of growing oak trees for maintenance and repair of the new college as needed. Now the trustees, you know, they were like, oh well, <laughs> if we'd only known about this, we could have planted trees or something back then, and who knows what's happened to it now. But 
probably a shopping center on there, but we have the deed, we have a responsibility. So this thing covered in dust they took and drove out to see where this property was. And they were shocked at this beautiful forest with a gated entrance and a caretaker's cottage in front of it. They got out and went and knocked at the door and the caretaker answered the door and said, yes, this is the property. It belongs to a new college, to Oxford College. And he said that he and his family before him had been wondering for a very long time when somebody from New College was going to show up out there. You know? And so he took them out into this beautiful manicured woods that he and his father and his grandfather and his great grand and great grand all the way down had been taken care of for all of these years because the nobleman had provided for that to be cared for in perpetuity for the college. And he took them out and showed them 200, 300, and 400 plus year old oak trees that they had maintained all this time, specifically for when the day came that repairs had to be made and things had to be done, or maybe even a new building built. Can you imagine that? This man having the foresight 500 years before when it was built to plan for the day when repairs would have to be made and to make provisions for that. That's what we need to be doing in the church Today, as we are making disciples for the kingdom of God, we need to be planning for the future even while we are living in the present. We need to be making plans for the, for the long haul, for lifelong discipleship that lends itself to discipling others so that we are leaving something for those who come behind. That's what Jesus calls all of us to do, to follow him as disciples so that we can disciple others. And so we should be asking ourselves this morning, how intentional are we about doing that? How intentional are we about making disciples of Jesus Christ to build the kingdom? Jesus ascended into heaven over 2,000 years ago, and when he did, he told us to go and make disciples of all people. He told us to, to build a kingdom, and he made specific reference to planning for that kingdom, leaving us with this question that's our responsibility, as it has been the responsibility of every generation of the church that's gone before, to know that there will be a generation that comes after us. When he asked, when I return, will I find faith left on earth? We have to answer that question. And we answer it by how we live, by how we live our lives, and by how effective and how intentional we are in building God's kingdom here and now. So we need to be witnessing to people. We need to be inviting them to church. We need to be instructing them in what it means to be a Christian and inviting them to receive Christ for themselves. And understand, once they do that, once they have received Christ and, and they come and they're baptized, what are they? They're not disciples yet. They're converts. They're babies in Christ, as Paul put it. And now is when the discipling really begins. Now is when we show them all of this. They've just met Jesus. They've just begun to believe. They don't even know what they believe yet. They don't understand it all. And so we need to know what the definition of a disciple is. What are we to be as God's people doing this work? And a disciple is, is someone who has an intimate knowledge of Christ in their own personal life, who is growing spiritually into the image of Christ, and who is striving to, to live their lives for Jesus so that He's reflected in what we do and in what we say to those around us in the world. So we need to focus on a few things in order to be intentional and to be effective in being his disciples. And the first, we need to, to answer the question, how do we help people know Jesus? 
And the first answer to that is by our example. By living as Christ among the people, as we are called to do and to be. Letting them see the Christian attributes of love, grace, forgiveness, mercy, compassion, and encouragement. And holding one another accountable to living that kind of a lifestyle. And we also do that through testimony. Through telling others what Jesus saved us from. What he's saving us to. And how he continues to work in our life. One of the greatest disservices we do to them is to let them think that because we're Christians we think we're perfect. And we're not and we know we're not. And as Wesleyan Christians... We understand we're always working towards perfection, but that moment doesn't come until we stand before Christ and hear him say, well done, then we're perfected. But we're working towards it. We need to share. We need to let them know, yes, we still make mistakes, but not like I used to make and share with them what I was before I knew Christ. The difference Jesus makes in our lives so that they can believe he can make a difference in theirs. And then we need to help them grow in Christ, grow spiritually by encouraging them to worship, to being here where they can hear the word of God proclaimed in message and in song. Remember, our hymns in this hymnal, that's the theology of the church. This we believe. This tells us what we believe and why we believe and the things God has promised us, the things Christ does for us. This is so important. We also help them grow spiritually the same way we grow spiritually by engaging with them in prayer, in Bible study, in, in practices of fasting. And we have to practice these disciplines with them, with them, in order to model discipleship for them. That way we can help them also begin to live for Christ. And how do you do that? Well, you do that through generosity. We encourage them by our own examples to invest themselves in Christ and in his church by sharing their gifts and their talents, by giving their time, by tithing and doing that by an example. We do it by mission, by serving others, by helping them serve others, by finding the places in our community where we can plug in, where we can do ministry, where we can make a difference in people's lives and honor Christ as we do that. And then engage them, invite them to come and be a part of that. And also through evangelism, encouraging them now to share their own witness, to testify to other people how Christ is beginning to work in their lives, what they are discovering, and inviting their friends, their loved ones to come on this journey with them. This is how discipleship works. This is how you build the kingdom of God. And to make discipleship intentional, we need to show up. We need to show up with passion and with a plan. You need a plan. And if we're going to have a plan, we have to understand that we don't need to be afraid to fail. God knows we're going to make mistakes. God knows that, that we're going to have some really bad ideas and some really good ideas. But if we are invested in that idea to glorify God, to try and, and build in his kingdom in that, God will bless us. I remind you of, 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 of this. How good an idea is this? Let's invite people to come and pay $50 for the privilege to run five miles at 8 o'clock in the morning on Thanksgiving Day. That sound like a good idea to you? Hmm? Most people go, that's the worst idea. How could you come up with something worse than that? And yet, that's exactly what three congregations did in Nashville. They call it the Boulevard Bowl. And it was to raise money for the hungry. I mean, I, I'm sorry, not the hungry, for the homeless in the Nashville area. 
It's a collaborative effort between Emmanuel Baptist Church, St. George's Episcopal Church, and the Temple Congregation Ohaba Shalom, the Jewish congregation there in Nashville. They formed and started this in 1994, the last year in spite of COVID. They had over 7,500 people registered to run that race. And since 1994, these three congregations with this terrible idea have donated $4,103,300 to the homeless shelters and homeless communities in Nashville. Doesn't have to be a great idea. You just have to be passionate about it and determined to do something with it and get out there and try. If it fails, okay, we know we need to go another direction. Try something else. But none of this happens without commitment. They've been so committed for so long that it's inspired other cities to do the same thing. A five-mile run at 8 o'clock in the morning on Thanksgiving Day. San Fernando Valley has one. They call it the drumstick dash. And in Napierville, uh, Illinois, they have the turkey trot. You see, if you're committed, if you get your priorities in order and put God first in what you're going to do and how you're going to do it, it changes things. And that brings us back full circle to the gospel lesson this morning. Because all three of these men had one thing in common. While they wanted to follow Jesus, they didn't want to do it yet. They want to follow Jesus, but first, I need to, you know. The first one, Jesus knew his heart and warned him. He said, hey, you know, I don't have a place to call my own. In other words, there's going to be hardship that comes along with being a disciple. The second one, Jesus personally invited to come and follow him. But he wasn't ready and made the excuse, well, you know, my dad's still alive. I've got to go work with him. I've got to help him. I've got to do all the stuff I'm supposed to do to be a good son. But when dad's gone, then I'll come and follow you. And then the last one said, oh, okay, but, but first let me go back home and say goodbye to always looking back, always and never forward. And Jesus' response to each one of them show us both the cost and the urgency of discipleship and of putting him first, getting our priorities right. You may have heard of this little experiment, but I don't know if you've heard what really went on with it. An expert on the subject of time management was speaking to a group of business students at one of our major universities. And so to drive home the point he was trying to make, he used an illustration that they will never forget. And he took a, a big one gallon pickle jar and he set it on the table in front of him. And then he pulled over this box of, of fist sized rocks and he began to put them down in that pickle jar and fit them around the best he could until he had every big rock he could squeezed into that. And then he asked them, is the jar full? And they said, yes. And he said, really? And then he pulled out a box of pea gravel and he began to pour that pea gravel and shaking the jar and it filled in the spaces between the big rocks. And it was done, he said, now is it full? Well, they're smart enough to know this is, there's something else to this. And they said, no, and he said, right. Because then he took a box of sand and began pouring the sand and shaking the jar until the sand had filled the places among the pea gravel. And he said, how about now? And some of them said, yeah. And some of them were like, well, we don't really trust you. And he said, well, watch this. And then he picked up a pitcher of water and poured the water in there. And when he was done, he asked them, he said, now what is the point of this illustration? And one eager beaver raised his hand and he said, well, he said, it's that no matter how full your schedule is, if you really try, you can always cram some more things in there. And he said, absolutely not. That is not the point of this illustration. And they were like, well, we, we don't get it. And he said, the truth that this illustration teaches us is this. If you don't put the big rocks in first, you can't put any big rocks in. 
It's called priorities, folks. If we fill our lives up with the little stuff, the trivial stuff, the fluff, until we're so full we don't have room for anything, you can't get the big things in there like God, like ministry, like sharing, like forgiveness, like worship. We've just scheduled God out of our lives. We've got to get our priorities straight and make sure the big stuff is taken care of first and then let the other things come as they will. Jesus said, follow me, a.k.a. Big Rock. That needs to be our foundation. That needs to be our first priority. We don't want to be caught saying, I'll follow you, Lord, but first, because then we've missed the boat. So we need to put our thinking caps on. We need to make some plans. And we need to make some plans on how we're going to make disciples, how we're going to, to plant acorns that will grow into oak trees that has a future for God's kingdom. How we're going to become stronger in faith so we can be more effective in our work and yield greater results for the Lord. Because even mediocre ideas executed with great enthusiasm bring results for God's kingdom when they're being done for the glory of God and the building of that kingdom. So let's make good on our promise to follow Christ and to serve him by serving others and doing it without making excuses. Let's pray for the grace to follow him faithfully so that we can disciple others in his will as faithful disciples of Christ. Our closing hymn is 164. Those of you here, I invite you to stand as we sing, if you're able. And the altar is always is open to anyone who would come and pray. Yeah.
Because we have placed our faith in you, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our eternity is secure. Give us grace truly, Lord, to follow so that we may lead others into your presence as faithful disciples building your kingdom. And as we go into a time of fellowship, we pray that you would bless the food that has been prepared, the hands that have prepared it. May the food strengthen and nourish our physical bodies allowing us to go forth and serve in the time of fellowship, nourish our spirits. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. 